Okay. So did you guys have a chance to get through more of those labs from the weekend? How are you no. feeling? No? No. I didn't. What about the pairing lab? How are you feeling with that? No. Yeah, I noticed. No? no? Why no? What's difficult about that lab? I just don't know what yet. I'm just doing the basics and like I got a really hard time. Well, it is basics. <laughs> the lab the lab might be difficult, but it does help you understand the basics better because you're learning how functions in JavaScript work under them. And that's fine. So that lab is it goes really well with this lecture. What exactly is functional JavaScript? So we talked about why JavaScript is so weird yesterday, right? One of the reasons it's so weird is because it's functional. So it's a functional language as opposed to a classical language. Like Ruby has a lot of classes. JavaScript has functions. So what does it mean that a language is functional? What can we do with functions in JavaScript? Alex? Exactly. So functions are like first class citizens in JavaScript. You can pass them into other functions. What else can you do with them? You can do like the, uh, the ifies, you can immediately invoke functions, which implies what? What's the opposite of that? Callback, exactly. So like passing a function in, that'll be invoked later. You couldn't do that with Ruby. You couldn't just reference to, to a function without it being invoked right away. Dan? You can... You're just reading this. <laughs> so clever. <laughs> yeah, you can save them as variables. Yeah, that's another thing. And then there's one more. One of your labs mentioned this about what makes functions first class citizens. There's another cool thing you can do with them. Steven, do you know? <laughs> Something inside of objects. You can have functions inside of objects. Like, that, this is what you were doing with your lab today. Your function is returning an object, and there's properties in that object, and the value of those properties is another function. So that's what's so cool about JavaScript. And then what about declarative versus imperative? Do you guys know the difference? Dan? Is based on like if, or, and, or Should I hide this? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is not like a concept that you're going to be actively working with, but it's important to understand the difference between imperative and declarative, especially when it comes to languages, like which <clears throat> languages are imperative versus declarative. Like sometimes you might get an interview question to describe the difference between imperative versus declarative. So with imperative languages, you're telling your program step by step what you want it to do. So for instance, you're going you're gonna to tell your program what you want it to do and how you want it to do it. Like if this, then do this, iterate here, and in the end return this. You're telling it step by step instructions. We are doing that with Ruby. We're doing that with JavaScript now. What about declarative? Peter? I'm assuming that that means the function already knows what's it, what it's going to do without your help. Well, kind of. Like with, uh, with declarative languages, you're saying exactly what you want. You're not saying how you want it. So think SQL. You're saying, I want this out of the database. You're just declaring what you want. And it's up for SQL to figure out how to get it back to you. So it would be like just setting, just having to return something just like a string. I mean, right now we're using JavaScript imperatively. We will be using it more declaratively in React. Right now we're just writing the step by step. This is not a concept to get hung up on. This is just like, this whole lecture is more about exposure to 
Like you don't have to understand how to use every single one of these things that we're learning today. Like we're going to be covering closure. You're not necessarily going to be writing your own closure. So you don't have to understand every single use case. But as long as you get exposure to this topic, it's going to help you a lot to just understand how JavaScript works under the hood and also to help you with interviews because interviewers love to ask about closure. And if you can't answer what closure is, it's going to be a problem. So this is just like about getting exposure to some of these complex topics. So don't get too hung up about imperative versus declarative. Do focus on pure functions, though. As I mentioned yesterday, this is an important concept. Like, how do you go about not mutating other things in your program? Because that's going to be important in React and Redux. So who can tell me what pure functions are? Andre? Come on, you know some <laughs> stuff. Um, function is just something that you can just call and you just pass in some arguments that perform some kind of method or action. Right, that's a function. Yeah. What about a pure function? Peter? You always know what you're going to get. Right, so for every time you give it the same input, you're going to expect the same output. You're not going, you have to, they have to be predictable. You have to know that if you give this input, you're going to get the same output every single time. An impure function wouldn't do that. What else, Alex? It doesn't, it doesn't cause side effects. Exactly, and what are side effects? Mm -hmm. It doesn't mutate or alter the data um, outside of the function. Yeah, it doesn't mutate anything outside. It doesn't change variables outside. In fact, it's not even good to be like pulling things in from outside variables that are in the global scope. Like You don't really want your functions to be relying on the same variables inside of global scope. OK, anything else? Any other side effects? So a side effect is anything other than what you're returning. So even like placing console logs is technically considered a side effect. It's things that your code is doing outside of what it's just returning from that function. So if you're changing other variables outside of the function, that side effects, even console logging is a side effect. All right, so we've covered that. And avoiding shared state as well. So avoiding using global variables in more than one function. We should really not just have global variables hanging out outside. We should really have functions be self-contained. And that's another big point of pure functions, just have the function be self-contained. So why don't we look at an example of an impure function? So I have a very basic app here. I haven't even set up my index HTML, which I need to do. Does everyone, anyone remember how? Right. So let's give it a heading. Any ideas of? Great. Nice. All right. And we're going to want to connect this JavaScript file, which so far is empty. How are we going to do that? Who remembers? Scripts. OK. What should the source be? Dash index.js. Are we missing anything? There's a period before the slash. You got it, guys. So, how do we test that it's working? Uh, alert. You can put an alert, sure. It's working. Oh, yo. I didn't yell at you guys in Chinese today. All right, so. It's open index HTML. It's working, so we connected our JavaScript file. Perfect. You don't have to clap. All right. So we're going to write an example of an impure function. First, we're going to have an array that we're going to later be passing into our function. Something very simple, like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So I want to write a function that's going to change 
every element in this array, but I'm going to do it kind of in a bad, impure way, okay? So we're going to do it, we're going to call it doubler, and it's going to take an array, and then we're going to do a for loop. And we're going to be changing the things in the array. Shall we test it? Let's just see if it works. Let's console log the result of running this function given our array. Why are you undefined? We do need a return value. Let's see if that works. Okay, so it's working. It's doubling everything, right? But I was saying that this is a bad function. It's impure. Does anyone know why? Peter? Because the original array is also. Yeah, you're mutating the original array. So what happens if I invoke it again with that same argument? What's going to happen? Right. So our output is no longer predictable because now it's different every time. We're giving it that same variable, but it's mutating the outside variable, and it's no longer predictable. So we can fix this. We can make this into a pure function. We can make a copy of that array so that we're not mutating the original array that we're passing in. Because Can anyone think of a good way to make the copy? You can use slice. We talked about that yesterday. So let's make a copy. So now we'll be working with mutating our copy and returning our copy at the end. But I thought you couldn't alter it in the const uh, declare variable. This might not work. Let's see. Because you're not reassigning, so it might work. But copy, it's not mutating the input. It's the same length, I guess. It's the same length. It's the same length. So this part doesn't really matter, but just to be more clear, let's just totally work with copy. So let's see if it's working. It's working. So now if we give doubler array, it's giving us the same input every single time. So the reason you can use const here is because, does anyone know? Marlon? Um, so you can use const on a um, primitive mm -hmm. data type because the primitive data type references directly a point inside of the, the, the it's like a specific data point. Mm -hmm. But when it's not primitive, it, um, it's, it's, you, you can go ahead and like change the data inside of the array. Mm -hmm. so it's a reference to mm -hmm. the array. What is a primitive data type? Anthony, do you know? Uh, yeah, so what kind of data types in JavaScript would be considered primitive? Exactly. Exactly. So what are more complex data types? Symbols, objects. Mm -hmm. So with const, you can mutate a complex data type. You just can't completely reassign it to a new array. So we're just mutating bits of it at a time, so it's working. But other than slice, what are some other ways that we can make a copy of this array? Marlon? I mean, we could make a new empty array, mm -hmm. but 
You could, and that's that's a really good way to do it to start with a fresh slate. Yeah. So. Then we can just. Is it working? Well, Why is it doing? Put the music? array in instead of what you're doing. Think like copy i is equal to array i times two inside of the for loop. Line seventeen. Yeah. The second copy should be array. Copy. Yeah. No. Well, you have to push it in there. Oh, yeah. But it shouldn't matter because you're assigning a specific index. Maybe it doesn't have an index in the array. Oh, because you're doing copy that link? Maybe you need to. And copy this. This is why I left it R, guys. <laughs> yeah, so awesome. that works. <laughs> it's giving us the same thing. There's another really cool way to do it. I don't know if anyone knows. You can do it with object.assign. I would prefer to show you object.assign when we're actually using objects, but we'll cover it briefly with arrays. Arrays are technically objects, so you can do it. Peter? Can't you technically just leave it in const copy and then get everything from there? No, because it's it not an array, so how can it set an index when that element is not an array? Let's try it. Let's see what happens. I'm kind of curious. <clears throat> and also because but you do left. it might work. Well, I don't think it will, but let's see. Yeah, so you can't set property zero of undefined. So it actually has to be an empty array if you wanted to do it that way. There's this cool concept of the spread operator that you could use. It's really exciting. Does anyone know? I, I get excited. Andre, do you know? I think that's where you take the array but like you create four arrays. Exactly. So it literally spreads your array out into values and removes the brackets around it, almost like flattening it. So you can put the dot 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 r. So it spreads this array out into its values, and by putting the brackets around it, by putting it into an array, you're giving it those brackets back. So now you have a copy of your array. So, so what would it be without the brackets? I tried to test it last night without the brackets, and the program did not like that. So Can you explain that again? I'll explain in a second. I mean, we can we can try to see so what you happens. Yeah, you really. I think you can do it with arguments, but see, it doesn't like this. But if you do dot 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 r, it puts your things back inside of an array. And the cool thing with the spread operator is that you can put stuff around it however you want. So you can have dot 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 r, and then you can add other values to it, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. And it takes the copy of that array, and then it adds other values into it. And you can put it before as well. Like you can put some stuff before this. One, two, three, four, five. And let's say we start here so that we know where our original is. We end here. So now we have our copy, but we've also included other stuff in this array. And I would say this is like the most standard way to copy arrays and stay away from mutating. Dan? So if you had two arrays, you could combine them using that too? You can. Let's try it out. I haven't really tried that out before. So let's make an array. What do we want in our array? Yeah. Andre and... Andre and... Okay. Why? What's wrong with you? I just defined you. Let's do it in node, see if it's better. Okay. Dan, Andre, Alex. What should we put in our second array? Am 
Why do I feel like we're missing someone? Okay. <laughs> Here's our R2. So let's make an R3, which is equal to the copy of the other two. Let's put Marlin in between them. Fun stuff. So now, moment of truth. I can. Yeah, no problem. Always let me know if you need it to be bigger. How are we on this concept? Good? Nice. Bad? Nice. Good, nice. yeah. So this is the most standard way that you would mutate without <laughs> mutating. Does anyone find something weird about how I wrote this function? Is there just a simpler array method we could use instead? Is, I mean, it feels weird that you have to write out every step of the iteration. But... Yeah, maybe there's something in JavaScript we can use instead. Yeah, let's do math. I was just trying to show you guys a point, but let's do it with math. Good review. Still takes an array. How would we do that? Andre? What do we start with? Do we, do we need to copy? Map will return returns. Map returns a new array. The array does dot map. Okay. R dot map. What does dot map take? Not a block. It's not Ruby. It takes a function, right? And what does that function take? Parameter. And what parameter does it take? It takes a parameter that represents each element in the array, one at a time as you're transforming it, right? Yeah, you can name it x, you can name it whatever you want. Mm -hmm. And then what? Okay, is this going to work? Let's try it. I was, I was going to have a little fun torturing you guys. Yeah, so it needs a return, right? Can you Where? Return R you can. Is that the only place? Let's see what happens. Fun times in JavaScript. I'll make this bigger. Why is that happening? We've invoked stuff. We've invoked plenty of stuff. Every function in JavaScript has to return something. Right. This is a function too. This needs to return something too. Returns are your friend. So now it's working. Yeah, is there? <laughs> no. Remember what? Remember when I complained yesterday how ES6 is releasing all these new features to please the Rubyists because they can't handle hardcore JavaScript? There's a way we can write this. Let's first think about how we can write this function with just arrow syntax in ES6. We can do a const You don't need to. You can have it be an anonymous function. Oh, inside that. Yeah. Yeah, this that part. part. And just the parentheses with the arrow pointing towards the return x2. Mm -hmm. Because it's only one argument, you don't actually even need the parentheses. So you only need the parentheses if there's no arguments or if there's multiple arguments. But if you have just one argument, you actually don't need the parentheses. So this should work, but there's also, if you know that you're going to have a one-line function that's just returning something, there's a way to do it 
without using return, and who remembers how to do that? Anthony, Anthony does. Um, after the 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 Mm-hmm. So we can just put it all on one line. And now it looks a lot more like Ruby. So this right here is the same as having the curly braces and having a return. It works the same. Let's make a brace with arrow notation. Yes, you can only do this with arrow notation. I would just say be really careful with this when you're using objects, because objects also have curly braces and it can throw you off if you're trying to like return an object because if you're returning an object and you're doing implicit return JavaScript is going to think that you're starting a function block so you can't do it when you have objects. Peter? Can we turn the first line into an arrow syntax too? Okay. Yeah. So yeah, instead of, um, instead of having that be multiple lines, we can then bump it up so that it's arrow syntax to the first one too. All right, let's try it. So let's write the whole thing as ES6. Doesn't need the function keyword, right? right. What does it need instead? Cons. Yeah. What is doubler here? Yeah. Equals it's set to this function. R arrow <laughs> you guys are amazing. Will this work? It works. You can get rid of these parentheses too. You don't have to. I mean, they both work. But... <laughs> and this is the beauty of chaining. It's really cool. All right, so that was a pure and an impure function. Let's talk about object.assign. Because some of these methods and or functions that you're writing with your lab can't mutate objects either. So let's talk about how to use object.assign. Has anyone used it already? No one has used object.assign? All right, you're in for a treat. So let's make an object. Well, I have to name it something. What should we name our object? Marlon. Always. What kind of stuff should we put inside of our Marlin object? Okay. A lot. Okay. Duck. Fun Funfetti? Fun Even more. Even more. Let's put something else. Duck. What's his duck's name? Oh, that's a good point. Do you guys remember how to access properties inside an object? These are the properties. This, the keys. They're, they're properties. No, I'm just saying, like, how would, if I wanted to get out from Fetty, because in JavaScript it's a little different from Ruby. Would you have to do um, Marlon and then the square bracket in quotes from Fetty? You can. Let's see. Marlon. <coughs> What's the more preferred way? Mm -hmm. Okay. So if we wanted to copy this Marlin object into something else, like say we have const Marlin copy, we couldn't just put Marlin here, right? And we all know why by now, right? We've all experienced the pain. Okay. So how? Can we do this with object dot assign? Marlon. Object dot assign and then in um, the round brackets uh, in Marlon. Let's try. I don't think that's going to work. I think it's going to be the same reference actually. Mm -mm -mm. Can't do that. <laughs> JavaScript is tricky, guys. So object.assign takes a few arguments. The most standard way to do it is to put an empty 
object first. This is like our clean slate. And then we can put Marlin here because this is the new object that we're making. And this is the things we're writing into that object. So if you do it this way, it's like you're writing all of the properties and values of Marlin into this brand spanking new object. And now they should be different. So if we do Marlin copy and Marlin, they're the same object. They look like they're the same stuff in it, but it should be different. So they're pointing to a different reference. The thing about object.assign and the reason it works so well with objects is because you can put other stuff after it. It can take as many arguments as you want after it. So these are the things you're writing into this new object from an object you already have, but you can put new properties inside an other object that you're trying to write in there too. So if we wanted to add something to Marlin, what kind of key value pair do you guys want to add? Scarf. I don't need these. <laughs> exactly. So now we've also added this other thing into Marlin. So you can't just do um, the key value pair outside of the curly brackets. It has to be in the curly brackets. I'm not sure. Let's try it out. And that goes into Marlin. Yeah. It goes in the Marlin. I'm not sure if that'll work. It might. It works. Nice. Nice. So if we look at Marlin. So if anything you add after the new object, it just appends it to the object. Right. I think if you wanted to, if you did use the curlies, you can probably put several things in here. But you can you can still put several things in here without the curlies. Like you can put. What else? Shirt. Exactly. Maybe we do need the curlies. Unless I was missing something else. Yeah, that doesn't make sense. See, this is why you need a linter. I didn't put a linter on this computer and it's having. All right, so there we go. What happens if we put a property here that's already inside of Marlin? Like confetti. What's going to happen? Mm -hmm. So the arguments of object.assign, usually an empty object. You can potentially have an actual object here. But usually it's an empty object that you're writing your new stuff into, like your copy. Then properties you want to add or stuff you want to overwrite. So ordering matters. Anthony? Can't we just increase the object that assigned the object? Yes, we can. We actually can. But if you want to add more stuff, you can just do the key value pairs after, after the spread? I believe we can, yeah. I'm not sure if they have to be in the curlies, but maybe not. So let's see. Shirt. I don't know if like if you add oh yeah no if you add more stuff they don't need to be in the curly yeah because now it's inside of this object and we've spread stuff out there is a problem yay there's a it's a small problem well it's actually not a small problem it's actually a big problem but you won't really have to deal with it very often it's the fact that if you had like a multi nested object. So this is considered a shallow object because there's just some key value pairs in it and none of them are 
complex objects. They're all kind of primitives. But if we had another object here, or even an array, like Marlin array, what should we put in your array, Marlin? If we use object.assign, and I believe even if we use this, it's going to clone all of these, but because this is nested, it's not going to clone this as a brand new thing. It's still going to point to the same reference. So I'm not sure if it's going to, let's see, with the spread operator, how it works. Invalid shorthand property initializer. What are you talking about? What's the issue? Is it more than a random solution? Of course. The things you just don't see. So Marlin array is equal to that. Marlin dot Marlin array is equal to that. The question is are they equal to each other? And yeah, they still are. And with object.assign, we have the same problem. So just be wary when you're using object.assign or cloning with this spread operator, that if you have deeply nested things, those won't, those won't copy over. You'll still be pointing to the same reference. So if I did something like Marlin array dot push. I wanted to push something into that array. It's there, but it's also going to be in our other one too. In Marlin copy because they're still pointing to the same reference. Don't worry about this too much. I haven't really had to deal around this problem. And if you Google how to solve it, there are some ways. I was looking into it yesterday, for instance. Found this thing here. Most efficient way to deep clone an object. That's what it's called, deep clone, because right now we're making a shallow clone. We're only cloning the things on the most outside layer and not like nested things. There's ways around it, including JSON parse, JSON stringify. It's so basically you just stringify that object and then it becomes its own object. So we can try it out if you want. I tested it and it worked, so let's see. So let's make a new copy. And if we're copying Marlin, see it copied over. So JSON stringify turns the object into a string, and JSON parse basically turns it back into an object. So now if we compare new copy dot Marlin array to Marlin dot Marlin array. I don't know why I named this Marlin array. They're actually two different things. But you won't have to use this very much. Does that make sense? How are we on this concept? Okay. So purity is desirable in JavaScript. If there's anything that you take away from this lecture is that we want pure functions. We don't want to mutate things. And I say things like mutate state all the time and that's going to really like, you're going to understand what that means when you get to React and Redux. Because it's all about doing things like object.assign and spread operators. So you don't mutate things that you already have. And so you're writing pure functions. Okay. Higher order functions. What are they? No one knows higher order functions? Anthony knows. That is one way to look at it. So functions that return functions are considered higher order functions. Functions that call other functions. 
and functions that take in functions as arguments can all be considered higher order functions. So again, that's what makes JavaScript so weird, that you can do things like pass functions around. You can have a function that creates other functions or a function that calls other functions. So my favorite thing, it's gonna, this is really cool. You can basically have a function called function runner that takes an array of functions and it calls all of those functions. So say we want to store the results of what it calls. And then we loop through all our functions. And then we call every single one. I mean, this is kind of like the stuff you've been doing with your dot each and with your functional library. This represents each individual function, and since it's a function, you can invoke it, and we can push its results into the array and return all of our results. So for example, if I write two very basic functions, like hello, that returns hello, and I write world, and it returns world, I can invoke my function runner. So let's see the results of what it prints out. And I can give it an array of the functions. And I'm not invoking these functions, that's the key. My function runner invokes all of them for me. That's really, really powerful. You can't really do that in other languages. So in Ruby, everything is tied kind of through relationships and classes. That's how things, data can communicate with each other. In JavaScript, things are tied through functions. That's the whole idea of functional JavaScript. In fact, like there aren't even classes in JavaScript. If you wanted to write a class in JavaScript like you do in Ruby, it's technically you write a function. With ES6, this class keyword has been introduced where you can write a class and it looks like you're writing a class, but under the hood it's actually still a function and the class keyword that was introduced is more considered syntactical sugar. So it's like to make developers happy and think that they're writing classes. So I, I googled this beforehand to show you an example. So like in older JavaScript ES5, in order to write a class, you're basically writing a function. So this looks kind of like Ruby with the self and all that stuff, except it's using this. And so ES6 uses this class keyword, but under the hood, there's no classes in JavaScript. It's all functions. So like even the concept of inheritance, it's really because you have some big overarching function that returns another function and your inner function has stuff that it's inheriting from the outer function. And that, my friends, is the concept of closure. Did you guys read about closure? Anthony? You know about closure. Closure is a difficult concept. I'm not going to kid you guys. <laughs> What is closure? I googled, what is closure? This is what Google has to say about what closure is. A closure is an inner function that has access to the outer enclosing functions variables. So scope chain, we talked about scope chain and the nesting dolls, how you can have like an inner function that goes up the scope chain and accesses things from higher functions. And the closure has three scope chains. It has access to its own scope, variables, between its own curly brackets, and then it has access to the outer functions variables, and it has access to the global variables. So what that looks like. Oh no. This is what Prince was talking about. Oh no. Did that wake everyone up? 
you get a simple closure yesterday, you can see call it closure. And you uh, have it like double invoking. Yeah, like 20, 20, 20. yeah, we did that. So the thing about closure, like, you're not necessarily going to be working with it, or even if you are, you're not going to realize that you're working with it. Like, you might be passing things around, and you might not be realizing that the reason you have access to them is because of closure, but it's just good for you guys to have exposure to what this means, like, in case of exposure to closure, so that if an employer asks you what is closure, you can explain it. Come on. It's really not different. Um, I was going to say, it's, it's, it's because, like, kind of, but not. All of the, when in the ring, all of the function, like it has access to everything, but so is this different, or is this just a fancy way to say that exact thing? It's a very slightly different. Pick it, I broke it, and I don't know how to fix it. <laughs> So do I have to reconnect my machine? Yeah, you have to reconnect. Oh, guys, 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 guys. It is one of those languages. It's like, this is my outer function. Outer function. This is my inner function. Inner function. This inner function has stuck in its own scope, because functions use curly brackets, so it has stuck here it has access to its own variables. So remember, like if we had a variable bananas, and then you're trying to use bananas in your function, it's going to first look in its own scope to see if it finds bananas. And if you had a bananas here, and this wasn't here, then if you're trying to use bananas, it first looks in its own scope, and if it doesn't find it, it moves up and finds it in this scope. So closure is this idea that your function has access to variables inside it, to variables in its parent function, and to global variables that are outside. But with closure, the outer function has to be run. It has to be invoked. <coughs> so you can initialize the variables that are in the outer function before the inner function can even have access to them. So that's the idea of closure. It is kind of like scope, but it also has to do with when you invoke the functions. And we're going to cover that a little bit more. Yeah, Could you ever invoke an inner function before invoking an outer function? No. no. I, don't, I don't even know how you would be able to. So, so we'll say it's always going to be invoked, so you don't really need to worry about like an extra invocation. You do have to worry about invoking. You have to worry about invoking both of them. So let me, I have a good example for you guys here. Okay. Per flat iron style, we're going to write something that's not so great, and then we're going to make it into something that's better. So we're going to have a global variable. We're going to have a count, like a counter that we start at zero. We're going to do some things here that's not necessarily closure yet, just accessing global variables. And then you're going to write a function called apples. So the idea is you have a fruit stand and you're selling your apples. And each time you sell an apple, your count goes up. So how would we write this function in ES6? Um, equals mm -hmm. bracket mm -hmm. every time you sell an apple, yeah, you don't need any arguments in this situation. Oh, uh, yeah, then the arrow, mm -hmm. um, curly brackets, uh, that would be to count plus equal to one, or count plus one. Mm -hmm. Count, Stephen? The arrow is pretty much like return. The arrow is not return. The arrow, this part right here, is the same as function. So you can replace this like that. The only time arrow is returned is if you have a one-line function and then you don't use these curlies, then you can have an implicit return. Good question. Okay. So we've incremented our count, and we're going to 
use a template literal. Does anyone remember how to use template literals? Like how do you interpolate into JavaScript? Yeah, you use backticks. So we're going to say something like I've sold dollar sign. Mm -hmm. Beast. Is that is that what you all are whispering? Yeah. Of course. I know my mod. All right. So we have our index HTML. I'm invoking my apples. Why? Why are you not defined? You are defined. Now do I need to just refresh the page? Yeah. So I can keep counting my apples, can keep selling my apples. Looks great, right? Yeah. Come on, Arlen. <laughs> just just we pretend we don't know. Let's go let's go with pears now. We're gonna sell some pears. It's gonna be the same thing. Except it's pears because pears are great, right? I don't, I don't really like pears that much. Hmm. 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 Let's invoke our pears. Selling pears, this is great. I want to sell some apples. That's not good. Mm. Damn it. <laughs> yeah. So we can't use the same global variable. We don't like global variables just hanging out because, yeah, no, no one likes that. You got to be self-contained. So how are we going to do this? How do we, how do we get rid of our global scope and allow our function to have a different kind of scope where it has something like a global scope, but it's not? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Buzzwords, that's all you need. You're hired. Yeah, closure, that's what I'm looking for. <laughs> what is a closure? Um, you can make a large or function around them. You can make a function within a function, right? So instead of having this count here, once again, we're only going to focus on apples. We can return a function. We can have our count in here. So now it's, it's not hanging out just globally. It's contained within its own function. And we can return another function. So how would we write an ES6 function? Oh, yeah. Bracket. And our inner function can return the count. Mm. So now we don't have a global variable hanging out. I like that. The counter is here. Oh, we need an Yeah, you're right. You're right. This would have broken. So now, what is apples? Not return. What is apples? It's just the function which you name. It's a higher level. It's a higher level function. So what should this console? It'll just have the anonymous function. Yeah, Steven? Mm -hmm. So it's going to show us exactly what apples is, which is a function that returns a function which returns a statement. This is what apples is. It's really important that you guys understand this. What is this, though? going to show us the, the second function mm -hmm. return. So we're invoking apples, and apples is returning this function. Mm -hmm. This function is not invoked. We're just returning another function. Mm -hmm. So if we wanted to get to this, mm -hmm. how would we do that? Mm -hmm. Well, we don't, we don't even need to console R, because this will return. Nice. Uh oh. Why? Oh no. What's wrong now? Because it's just every single time he's doing plus one. Because mm -hmm. the local variable is minus one. 
Because you reassign the variable. Yeah. It's zero. You're invoking them twice every single time. So you're starting over from the beginning every single time. Your count starts at zero, it goes up one, and then you invoke twice again, and it does the same thing. So really, and this is the concept of closure, what we really need to do is invoke the outer function just once. And we can invoke the inner function as many times as we want for that count to go up. But the outer function only has to be invoked once so that we can start this at zero and freeze it the way it currently is. And we can do that with an if you. You, you look like your mind is blown. Tell me more about what you're processing right now. Well, I thought it was just going to be like we're going to return a constant, like 3.5 and a non-mixed function, but now you're saying if you, so now we're going to So we just invoke it, invoke it immediately below the it. Right. So in order to invoke it immediately below, since we want to invoke this whole thing, we want that whole unit, so we're going to wrap the whole thing in parentheses. And we're going to invoke it. So now, what is apples? Yeah, what is apples? Apples is now this. Because initially, apples was this whole function. What does that function return? It returns another function. When does a function return something? When you invoke it. So we've invoked it here. So it's already been invoked. So it's it's already been invoked. It's so, so it's equal to this function right now. Is it sitting in memory? Or something like that. That's closure. It's closure. It has it knowledge wait, so of the context when it was invoked, where it was invoked, what the variables were at the time. That's the whole concept of closure. Can we, just so my brain can see it, can we reactivate the pairs and make it look like apples? Like we will. We're going to get to that in a second. So, Stephen, are you okay? Well. <laughs> <laughs> Your mind was so blown. So basically, apples. Stephen, you were totally on the money when you told me that apples, when you console log apples, it's this whole like double function thing. Yeah, and then like when you call it the parentheses at the end, you're invoking that function. Yeah, so and now it's like, just. Now it's just like, how does it do that? How does it like. Because we told it to. That's why. It's right here. This whole thing has just been invoked. Oh, right here. Is it like both the parentheses around the entire function and the parentheses? Yeah, I believe this won't so work. Oh, okay, wait, so it's those parentheses right there that's invoking, not yeah. the ones that are wrapped around them. Yeah, the parentheses at the end invoke a function, because that's how you invoke a function. Like when we did doubler, <laughs> we invoke it. So this means you're invoking it. It's not taking any arguments. If it takes an argument, you can put an argument there. But you need the parentheses any time you invoke anything, except dot length. Like even to uppercase, you need the parentheses. Dot slice, you need the parentheses. It's not like Ruby. So we're invoking it here. I don't think this will work unless you wrap the whole thing in parentheses. Because we really want to capture this whole function as an entire unit. So it's like the math operations. Yeah, so things in parentheses. So now. Apples is that. So if I invoke apples, because apples is now really this, when I invoke it, I can get this. 
when I invoke it again, my count is going up. Yes, Dan. So if we added another invoke at the end of it, would it just, would you just type it afterwards? Would it just return? Like two invocations? In, in your, the way in your code, it's your code at the end of the first invoke. Like the beginning of the function, if you put another invoke at the end of it, would it just, oh, if you, if you did another five right there. Yeah, so, yeah, I think if you do it this way, what's going to happen is that you don't need this. Oh, I see what you mean. Okay. Yes, yeah, so, well. Return this. So the inner, the inner function is 64. Line 64 is 67. Yeah, 64 is 67. If you remove what you added there, that's So you don't want to invoke the inner function? And, and now it's 68. Add another one. Yeah, another. Yeah. Another invocation. Yeah. I think that it's going to just have apples at one every time. Wait, what? We have to read the fresh page. Yeah, so it's it's the same problem we had before, because you're not calling the outside function once. I thought you were talking about like what happens if we immediately invoke the inner function. I think it's going to be the same problem. It's the same problem. Because you're not you're invoking the inner one every time you're invoking the outer one. We really need to just invoke the outer one once and then not invoke it anymore so that our count can keep moving up. So let's do this with pairs. It's going to look not like dry code for now, but we'll fix it later. Now apples is going up, pears is going up, and they have separate counts, right? This whole iffy thing is kind of complicated. People don't really do it this way. There's actually a more convenient way to do this. I mean, it's the same concept, but instead of immediately invoking your apples, why don't you just save them being invoked to a variable? So like apple seller. So it's like the iffy thing, right? We're still invoking this outer function. And we're saving its invocation into another variable. So now we've invoked the outer function once. That happens on line 80. And since this is now set to a function, we can invoke this. And that way we don't have to do the whole iffy thing. So if we don't want to start selling apples until we're ready, it's, like it's not going to activate until we turn apple seller on? Or is it just on automatic because it's a save for the apples? So I'm invoking this whole outer function down here instead of immediately. So I guess you're right, like you're not ready to sell them right away, but like later you want to sell apples. So you call this function, it sets up a counter at zero, and this variable is set to this return, and then when you sell one apple, you can just invoke this instead. So let's try that. So what is apples right now? The full function. What is apple seller? Yeah, because we've invoked that whole outer function and it returned just the inner function. And we've done it without the iffy thing. This is like the simpler way to do it. And since this 
is equal to a function, you can invoke this variable. So every time you sell an apple, you can just invoke that. And we've achieved our closure because we only ran this outer function once, and now we can run this every time, and it has that closure. Marlon? Is that impure because when we invoke apple seller, we're catching something outside of it? I would say it's pure because it's self-contained. It's just the concept of closure. Okay. So even though const apples and const apple seller are two different variables, um, they're still considered pure because it's like the same reference. Is this the same way that in Ruby we want to have like each each function be less than seven lines because it's prettier and we want to call the like other functions within other functions? Okay. So let's do a pair of seller. Same concept. We can get rid of the whole. I'm gonna. I'm about to make a joke. We can get rid of the whole iffiness. I know. So now, what is pairs? What does that look like? It's the whole higher level function. What is pairs seller? Mm -hmm. So pairs seller allows us to sell pairs, and apples seller allows us to sell apples, and they have different closures. So we've achieved what we wanted to, but how can we make this code more dry and only use? One function that can take any fruit. Steven? What's the uh, verb that you use to invoke? Invoke. To invoke a function? The invocation of a function. Invocation mm -hmm. Peter? I was going to say just create a seller, um, seller function. Sure. So we can sell any fruit. So maybe we can give it a parameter. What should we call it? Okay. Well, we want our counter because the goal is not to use any of this. Uh, we're going to need two different types of counters. We're going to need to find, are we keeping track of all fruit we're selling or just each individual? Just one species of fruit, like banana or kiwi or orange. Let's start with this, right? We're going to need a counter. What am I returning? We want a closure. Yeah, but we have to do the same. Right. So we're returning another function. Right. And here we're returning. I've sold count fruit. <coughs> and we do need to increment our count. Good point. So, what's your question, Marlon? Well, the thing is, it's like that can work if you can consistently only sell one type of fruit, but we need a separate counter for each type of fruit. Do we? Because, well, like, I mean, wow, I think it's so long. Let's try. Let's try. What kind of fruit do we want to sell? Okay. Some people might debate you on that. <laughs> I'm not one of those. I'm not one of those. So avocado. Now we want to invoke mm -hmm. with Let's give it plural just because how this is going to work. So we just add the S at the end of the 
It could. So what is this going to be? Let's let's first examine seller. What should seller be? Mm -hmm. Everything. What's avocado? It's the inner function. So we've essentially run seller once. We've started our count at zero. Now every single time we want to sell an avocado, we can invoke avocado because avocado is equal to a function and functions can be invoked. Marlon? Oh my gosh, but if you prefer because it's going to be a constant, it's going to create a different counter for each thing. So avocado. I've sold some avocados, right? I want to sell a different fruit. What kind of fruit should I sell? What? Grassberry? Grassberry. It's a berry. So we're selling two berries. <laughs> <laughs> it's not going to pluralize correctly. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do that way. Cuter way. I love it. What other fruit you want to sell? Coconut? I like that one. Nice. No. Noise. All right. So I can still sell my avocado. I can sell raspberry. Has its own closure. <laughs> I can sell coconuts. JavaScript. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> that is that is how you use classes in JavaScript without using classes. That is the whole point of this lecture. That is the whole point of functional JavaScript. So if we're creating a constant that's declaring the variable inside of the function that is invoking, that that becomes okay. Okay. That's what you said. You're like, this took me a very long time to understand. So you said, you said that yeah. class inheritance is just a function around it. Exactly. That's what closure is. It's not the same name. It's like being declared. It's being declared under a separate constant. So the constant can store its own, can store its own variables. It's its, a, it's its own record. Like, this is called once. It closes over whatever variables were here. So const whatever was zero. It closed over that. And now you can reference that variable and it remembers what it was at the time you used the call. That's the constant. All right, what else do I have? <laughs> I feel like the rest of this lecture might not be as exciting. You're doing it, so it's going to be just as exciting. <laughs> OK. Yeah. yeah. So that's why JavaScript is so cool. You have this ability to kind of like partially execute functions. You've executed one part of this whole function, and then later, you're getting to that return and you're executing more stuff. So you're wrapping things. Yeah. Fucking jawbreakers. I'll let you stare at this glory of JavaScript. <laughs> so this will be a preferred way to do it, right? Like yeah, that's As the preferred to, way. Like, we'll wrap it in manually. And making an iffy yeah. like this is yeah. this is better. I can now I can see what this is. Yeah, yeah because whenever you want to sell a fruit, you just invoke your whole thing, you inherit whatever, and then you have your counter at zero and you can keep selling as many of that fruit as you want. So are there any times when you prefer an iffy over doing it this way? I don't remember, but I feel like those situations are rare. Any other questions? How is this concept? Good, bad? Peter? I, just because um, I do want to, uh, um, if like I was like really wanting to refactor and see, make it as like pretty and like single line as possible, can we That's do good. that with this? Like, I, like, um, well, with this, I don't think you can because. Because, the variables. Good because this is a two line thing. 
So you wouldn't really be able to turn this into a one-liner. I think this is the cleanest way to write it. Great, yeah, I just, yeah, that's, yeah. Okay, well, on to other things now. This is just, this is part of it. We're also going to do a little bit of DOM manipulation, just because we want to sprinkle some DOM manipulation here and there, so you guys understand DOM manipulation before you have to do labs that are all about DOM manipulation. So remember how yesterday I told you about a specific event listener that waits for the page to load? Do you remember how to write that? Oh, you guys can do it together. Yeah. You, you all got like the little pieces of it. We're listening for an event. Event listener. Add event listener. What does an event listener take? It takes two arguments. The first one is what event you're listening for, like a click event, a mouse hover event. We're listening for DOM content loaded. And it takes a callback, right? And then it takes the function that we're do. So we can do some stuff here. <laughs> well, we'll do that in a little bit. The point of this whole thing is I want us to be able to grab a bunch of LIs. So I'm going to create a bunch of LIs. Hello there. And by a bunch of LIs, I literally mean a bunch of LIs. Screwed one up. No. Okay, okay, okay. Maybe a few more? Yeah. <laughs> I feel like there has to be an easier way. Just do. Just copy paste all those and repaste them. Whoa, 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 whoa. whoa. This isn't. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. We're good, we're good. We're good with our allies. Why are you so small? Okay, how would we grab all of them? Query selector, or no. Only query selector the, all? No, it's query selector because you can do the L. Can. Uh, because you can do the, just the H1, so it's going to be query selector. Element selector? You can, do, you can do get elements by yeah, tag yeah. name, you can do query selector all. Yeah, it would be elements.tag name. Okay, and then it would be so. Which one? Uh, elements by tag name. Mm -hmm. And then the line. We got them. Nice! Okay. Let's do some cool stuff. Let's see. What was I going to do with these? Oh, I was going to change the color of these. So we have our elements, right? How did we grab them? How did we get that document? We can loop over them. There is. We'll get to that. <laughs> no, today, in a few minutes. <laughs> okay, so we're looping through our elements. I want to do something to each element, so I'm going to capture each element. Just because it's cleaner to do something to this L thing as opposed to to, to this thing. So let's change something about it. So L, I had this whole thing, style dot color, because each of these elements has this style and color. <coughs> so if I put a debugger in here, we'll be able to see that. Let's 
So this is our element. See, this is like stuff that lives in the DOM that you can touch and manipulate. So each of these elements has a style and you can access the color. I guess because it's black, it's just blank. It's like the default, but you could technically change it to like using RGBA. I don't know if that has to be a string. So if I wanted to give it some random color. You see how the first one changed color? So you can you can grab your elements, you can change their color. So that's what I was going to do here. So I'm going to reset the color of each of these elements. We can. That's what we're going to do. Well, let's do it this way. Let's do RGB. And we're going to have, we're going to keep zero for now. And then for the last one, why don't we do something like I times 10 and see how this might change our page. Did I take the debugger out? <laughs> did I though? I did. And it still worked? Yeah, it still worked. That's cool. Well, what happens if we like change this to something? Wait, am I doing this right? Because the color is such a huge spectrum. Let's do it this way. Hell yeah! That's pretty cool. So cool. So I'm manipulating this stuff. You can do stuff like this to the DOM. That's cool. Hmm. What if we do a for each? What if we do a for each on top of these elements? Let's try that. Because this for loop thing is not that useful. So what does for each take? I don't know what it takes. It's kind of like a map. So it's going to take what you're going to define everything. Function. It's going to take element, and for each element, we want to do this, right? Oh, no. What is else? Else, he's not gonna show me what else is. Let's do this again, guys. Let's. Yeah, we are. We are missing something. We're missing this whole array-like object that I mentioned yesterday. <laughs> so this is not an array. If you do array dot is array. It's not an array. You can't really do array methods on it. So the reason we were able to use the for loop, which I've now erased, is because we weren't technically doing an array method. We're just using a for loop. And we were resetting each element based on what i was. But here, we're trying to do an array method on the elements, and it's not working. So how can we coerce this into an array? It starts with array. <laughs> it starts with array because it's a method that lives on the array prototype. Array from. Because now we've turned this into an array. Okay? This whole thing. It looks like an array, and if we do array dot is array, it's an array. Okay, so do you think this will work now? Yes. Maybe? Do we have to return? Uh, 
I don't think I don't think that's the problem. I think the problem is the color is the same for each thing. Because we're no longer working with I, we don't have I anymore. What are we trying to change here? So what we could do you can do like 240 or something, but now it's not as fun because now our things are not all different colors. You're doing the same thing to each element. So this is working. It's just not doing something as cool as we want it to. Maybe we can randomize things a little bit. Maybe that'll be fun. Maybe we can do math.random. So random. How does that work? How does math.random work? It takes in a range, two variables as a range, right? Well, math.random returns a random number from 0 to 1. So if you wanted like a random number from 0 to 10, you do math.random times 10. And then you floor it so that it doesn't have a decimal. So you do math.floor and wrap it. But how many how many colors are the are in the RGB thing? Okay, so let's do times 250. So maybe, just maybe, if we give it a random one, it'll do something more cool. It is doing something cool, but the color is not as interesting because it's, we're just touching the first one. And they're all still the same color because we're not resetting the value for each one. So maybe if we reset our random to this, it'll pick a new random color for its next iteration. It's working. It's working. So maybe it's not going to be super clean, but we can make one for all of them. Why is this? We can do like a random two and a random three. And we can reset our random two. And our random three. And then we can put them in here. Maybe that'll give us something more colorful. Oh, yeah, you guys. <laughs> That's kind of cool, right? But sometimes we don't want this whole thing hanging out. We can just ex extrapolate this into a named function. So like const color changer. And just pass it color changer. No, oh, I can type. Why won't you work? What's wrong? Well, it should get invoked when it listens, when the content is loaded. And the reason we want to have content loaded is because we want our allies to be available on the page before we try to do something to them. Yes, you're so right. Yeah, that is actually what the issue is. Yeah. Nice job, Marlon. So, we've covered. We can use the S6 notation. But we'd have to define it before we use it. We would have to define it before we use it. So, one more thing. If we did use query selector, so is it query selector? Oh yeah, this is giving us the first one. We want all for all of them. 
But this doesn't say HTML collection. This says something else. This is also not an array. But there's secretly, there's a way to check what methods are available. So stuff we want to change. And we could have done this with get elements by tag name. So we've saved this. If you do this dot, I believe it's proto. Nikki can correct me. It tells you what you have here and the different stuff you can call in it. So if we did query selector all, we can actually use for each without coercing it into an array. Let's try that. I don't know. It's JavaScript. It still works. So just something to be aware of. So if I did the other one, what was it? Document dot get elements by tag name li and I save them into a variable and then li proto we see this is an HTML collection and you can't really call many things on this Mm -hmm. Yeah. You might not even need the brackets. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's the same thing. So, yeah, you can do stuff like this. So, just be very wary of the elements that you're trying to grab and what kind of collection they actually are when you're trying to manipulate stuff so that you don't run into trying to work on an array that's not an array or using a method that that type of array like object doesn't actually support. Good bad on this stuff? Any questions? That's it? Okay. Can we, oh, Yo. What if, can we put an event listener for each click on, on each LI, like each individual LI? Yeah. So with click, I think it's on click. On click. Or you can, I think you can literally do on and then just give it click because click events are so often. It's not. Let's do event listener click. Oh, you have to do it on the whole thing. So. Is it dot add event listener? Click. Actually, yeah, no, let's just do it this way. So now we're doing it on one individual element, right? Let's see if it works. I might have to take some of this stuff out. Yeah, let's try that. That might work. Oh, but it does all of them. So I think this is a situation where you would do a for each. And so for each element, have this event listener that will make that one element change color. So instead of query selector all, it would be all that last So I think you can do something like global scope, but whatever, we're going to do it. We can put all of our variables or our whole collection here. And then for each. So for each element, right, we're going to 
add a click event. Event listener takes a callback. What are we going to give it? Color changer? So now we would have to rewrite color changer to respond to only one element. So we don't need this here. We don't need this here. And we don't need these. That might work. Let's find out. L is not defined. Maybe I need a return. That's in color changer L is not uh, the LSL in color is not defined. Where? Oh. Maybe I have to. My color changer takes an element. So my color changer takes an element. I'll just change it. Hang on. Cannot set property of undefined. Um, so you still shouldn't be asking. color changer should still be a callback, and then that what can be passed in there to be used. Okay, I'll untest this. Cannot set property color of undefined at color So on change. six, um, don't execute color changer in the parentheses. Um, and then the argument you're actually getting Oh yeah, now I remember event listeners. So the event has to be here? But it should be the same thing, yeah. But that should have technically worked, right? Um, well, so the, the event, in order to get to the element, would be event.target. Where? Right there. Uh, nice. Yeah. Oh, this is this is really fun, guys. I like this. Before you clap, I want to leave you guys with a treat today. Some of you saw me laughing yesterday and thought I was slacking off, but really I was watching this, and it's really funny. So I'm going to show it to you guys. Props to Nikki, because it was in her lecture that I was watching. How do I bigger this? Why won't it get bigger? Let me refresh. What? All right, good. You guys know what WAT means? WAT? Exactly, exactly. Let's talk about Ruby. Uh, in Ruby, if you reference an undefined variable, of course it name errors, as you'd expect. And if you try to assign uh, B to A with them undefined, of course it name errors, as you'd expect. And what happens if you try to assign A to A with A undefined? Correct? No. What? <laughs> Let's talk about Ruby. <laughs> Ruby, unlike uh, some other dynamic languages, does not have bare words, so you cannot just type words in and have strings come out. Unless you define uh, a particular <coughs> method missing that does the right thing. And then if you type bare words, suddenly Ruby supports bare words. And in fact, it will even support bare words with bangs in them. Uh, and this, this is not deserving of WAP. This is actually a result of how awesome Ruby is. 
But if you ever actually do this, then, what? <laughs> Let's talk about JavaScript. <laughs> Does anyone know in JavaScript what array plus array is? Well, let me ask you this first. What should array plus array be? Empty array, I would also accept type error. Uh, that is not what array plus array is. Wrong. <laughs> Wrong. Array plus array is empty string. <laughs> Obviously, I think, that's, I think that's obvious to everyone. Uh, <laughs> Now, what, what would array plus object be? This should obviously be type error because those are completely disparate types. Uh, does anyone know what this is? Uh, no, close, no, far away. It's object. <laughs> All right, nicely done. Now, of course, because uh, this is plus, so you can flip the operands and the same thing comes out. So if we do, what? No, that's just an object. Uh, if you do object plus array, you get exactly the same thing, which, as you can see, you do. <laughs> and finally, uh, the only one of these that's actually true is uh, because you know you add arrays to empty string that doesn't make sense. But an object plus an object is actually not a number. <laughs> so this one's actually right. And uh, exactly right. Like, what is even going on? In this lab, I just I don't even understand uh, what person with a brain in their head would think that any of this is a good idea. <laughs> okay, okay. Enough making fun of languages that suck. Let's talk about JavaScript. <laughs> <laughs> if I say array dot new sixteen, uh, or just array sixteen, I get an array of sixteen things, which it represents as sixteen commas, which is obvious, and. Uh, <laughs> If I then join those with a string, then I get the string 16 times. This is actually the only line in this entire presentation that's reasonable. Uh, now, if I take that string and then add a 1 to it, it interprets uh, the 1 as, or, or casts the 1 to a string, and then we get whack 1 a bunch of times, fine. Does anyone know what will happen if I subtract 1 from the string? <laughs> I'm assuming no one does. Let me, I'll give you a hint. Does, does this help? <laughs> Does anyone know? <laughs> That's all I got. Thank you. That concludes this lecture. It's time for vlogs. Was I recording? Are we going to jump right into the vlogs? You guys need a minute? I need a minute. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to go to the bathroom, grab a drink. I move vlogs into this room. Yes. Although, Wait a minute.